Right, um, my name is Terry Froy. I've been working at the School of Physics and Astronomy at Queen Mary for the past three and a bit years. Um, prior to that, I used to work in the Central Networks team at Queen Mary from January 2011, I believe. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about Anycast, DNS64, and NAT64. So, um, without going over old ground, Chris has already covered this. Uh, that's Queen Mary, four campuses in London, lots of departments, lots of students who are lovely, lots of staff who are even more lovely, and that's our website. Feel free to check it out. Uh, I do lots of things. Um, by weekday, I do what Chris used to do, and I run the, uh, along with my colleague Dan, the GridPP cluster that does lots of whizzy things with LHC data. I'm not a physicist, I'm a computer scientist, so think opposite. Um, now, the cluster at Queen Mary uses a um, more simplified version of the design I'm about to show you, uh, because uh, GridPP doesn't really have the money to do things resilient in a resilient fashion, but it doesn't need to do it, as per the reasons Chris has already explained in his presentation. Um, plus, the less devices in the traffic path, the better it is for performance. Um, uh, by evening and weekends, um, I've been running a commercial ISP, which I'll tell you about on the next slide. Um, but seeing as though everyone in this room, most everyone in this room, is a network operator and are really concerned with resilience, um, I felt it better to describe that implementation um, rather than the one at Queen Mary. Um, so. This is what I believe qualifies me to stand in front of you and talk about IPv6. So, um, started in 2003, uh, due to necessity, because all we had was dial-up, uh, ADSL had only just come out um, in our neck of the woods, um, but unfortunately, due to uh, the quality of the copper, or should I say aluminium, um, ADSL was pretty much a non-starter in the area. Um, I had a need for reasonably fast connectivity, so I got a 512 kilobit circuit from Pipex, and uh, then when, we got, when I got the bill, I realized, crap, I need to uh, pay this bill somehow, and then I started selling 64 kilobit always on directional wireless to friends, neighbors, and relatives in Lincolnshire, because Lincolnshire is a very flat part of this country, which means it's very easy to set up wireless links. Um, and this was sort of before Ofcom had actually started regulating the wireless, the wireless spectrum in that area. Um, but we're all legal and above board now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd better mention that. Um, <laughs> hopefully no one in, I'm off from Ofcom's here. Um, so, been doing IPv6 since the very beginning, uh, obviously via 6 in 4 because V6 at that point, uh, Pipex was certainly not doing it. Um, we got some V6 space from, I think it was BT Exact at that time, when that tunnel broker service was running. Um, but in 2007, um, the business had grown to such a point where it became more of a, it had to be run properly. You know, I had businesses on the service and they expected, you know, SLAs and everything. So that's when you start doing things as you should be doing. So uh, became a ripe LIR in 2007, got the ASN, V4 and V6, multi-homed, um, and then uh, after pestering upstreams for, with numerous emails, uh, I'm probably on a few, uh, you know, don't sell to this guy ever again lists. We got native V6, no tunnels, uh, and we've been doing that for the last 10 years. So, why did, uh, why DNS64 and NAT64? Well, the core has been, uh, because we did V6 from day one, um, I decided that I didn't really want this IPv4 thing on my network because it was going away. No one knew when it was going, going to go away, and of course it's still with us 10 years later. But I wanted it to be as simple as switching that stuff off and taking it out of the racks. Um, plus, of course, um, most BGP implementations are single-threaded, so um, it actually helped to spread the, the BGP load around um, and routing tables. I didn't have to worry about the, routing the V4 routing table eating up all the memory in my routers, which were quite well, low powered at the time, because they didn't have to be high powered. Um, dual stack, as we've heard today, does add unnecessary complexity to a network. Um, 
we are, we are encouraging people to obviously dual stack their kit, but the end goal in this, in this journey is to actually get rid of IPv4. So it, it's easier. Um, we have no expectation from our users that they have to use IPv4. We've supported v6 from day one. Um, customer CPEs are enabled for v4 because they expect it, but um, we can do v6 only, as is going to be described in here. Um, I brought this into Queen Mary when Chris brought up the topic of IPv6 on the WLCG and running v6 only worker nodes. Um, as I had a lot of v6 experience, I threw my tuppence in and uh, we did write a research paper, which you can find if you Google. Uh, so what is Anycast? I'm quite certain that most people in here do know what it is. Um, Anycast is being able to put one, query one IP address, say 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 and get a DNS response from it very fast. Um, multiple instances, but end users will only see one instance at a time. But the whole point is that if one of those instances goes away on the network, then another quickly takes its place when routing table reconverges. So um, this is a basic diagram of what the current network topology in London looks like. So we have uh, two core routers, and those are the V6 core routers, because there's no V4 involved in this. Um, so customers connect in via um, BT Wholesale or TalkTalk Talk Business over L2TP. So they connect. Radius on our side, because we don't have session steering, determines which network server they connect to. Uh, when they're connected, they get v6 or v4 prefix. In this case, it's a v6 only prefix. And that's propagated across the core. Um, the network servers just have a default route and they share their connected customers to the core. So Alice can talk to Bob, Charlie, David, and vice versa. Um, it's designed as such that um, if a core router fails, um, all the L2TP servers, because the, L the L2TP comes in to that core router, customers will just drop there and they'll reconnect on one of the other three. Basically, there is no single point of, there is no single point of failure in there. I can't speak for the switches outside because that's provided by a third party um, who I'm not going to name because you don't need to know who they are. Um, DNS 64. We've covered that briefly. Um, it's a DNS resolver service that lies when it has to. Um, so, um, how does it work? Well, query it for A record, it'll give you one, if there's one. If you query it for an A record, quad A, and you get one back, it'll supply that. It only kicks in when you've got a quad A record and the authoritative DNS servers don't have one because the remote site hasn't enabled their stuff for v6 or they don't want you to access it over v6. Uh, so DNS64, that's how, that's the flow from a client that wants to access the Queen Mary website because unfortunately Queen Mary hasn't yet enabled its public facing website for v6. Um, but that's another story. So, um, <coughs> all we get back at the end of that is an A record, which a V6 only client can't do a lot with. So, client asks for that quad A record, so it can't do anything with that A record. So, the resolver gets the V4 address in decimal, converts it to hexadecimal. It doesn't, but it's there for the human, humans here. We, we, we don't understand binary. Well, I, I'm not going to write binary on there because it's pointless. Um, so DNS64 resolver synthesizes using, on this implementation, the well-known NAT64 prefix, sticks that 32-bit IPv4 address on the end, and returns a 128-bit IPv6 address in the form of a quad A record to the client. But all the client has done now is resolve. It hasn't connected. So the next piece of the puzzle, NAT64. Um, it converts v6 to v4 and vice versa. There's a little bit more involved in that, but the RFCs are there if you wish to read them. Uh, like most NATs, uh, NAT can either be stateful or stateless. Um, so we're covering stateful NAT. Stateless NAT is easier to set up uh, because you don't need to share session state between any instances of your NAT64 
um, instances. So um, we, run two in we two, run two translators per pop because we don't want a single point of failure. And a PC, even if it's running Linux, can fail. So um, we have two. Uh, but because they're stateful, they have to share state in order for TCP connections not to be broken when one fails. So how we do this is we use uh, CentOS 7.6, which I've just updated them to, and it actually works, and uh, a piece of open source software called uh, Joule, uh, and its latest incarnation at 3.5.8. Uh, we were running 3.5.7, um, no issues with that. 3.58's a bit new. So how this works is we've got the v6 prefix, uh, which our v6 clients will talk to. And because they need to speak, uh, so because that needs to talk to the internet, the legacy internet, we have to advertise some v4 out of it as well, because when that gets translated, the return, you know, it's going to have to use a v4 source address, and that traffic has to come back in. So it has to advertise to our v4 core, so it gets the return traffic. Um, we also have a link local VLAN between the two stateful instances to send and receive session state. If one translator sees a session and it, built, it creates, adds it to the session table, it tells the other one, and therefore, um, and vice versa. So if one dies, sessions carry on. What does it look like? So this is where we've actually split the core out. So we have v6 core with the stateful NAT64s advertising the slash 96 prefix to that, the session state sharing between them, and the v4 block, which is the same v4 block, it's, I think it's a slash 27 uh, currently, um, to each of the v4 core routers. Um, those blocks are v4, there is IBGP between the v4 cores, and there's IBGP between the v6 cores. Um, so if any of the core routers fail, there is a path to a stateful NAT64. Does it work? So this is from one of my machines on the end of my FTTC at home, which is v6 only. It has no v4 default route. It has no v4 on it, as per the IP route LS. So pinging the Queen Mary website on its non-existent quad A record, at least as far as they're concerned, we've got a synthesized v6 address, which we can ping. And reverse DNS works as well. Um, DNS resolvers that currently support this are Bind, PowerDNS, um, I'm not sure of any others. Um, if anyone wants to add that, then please tell me. Um, but we're currently using a combination of PowerDNS and Bind in some locations. So then, of course, we want to actually test to make sure that TCP actually works, because that's going to be most people. So we do a wget. Um, note it gets the quad A and it gets the A, but of course it does the quad A first, because everything prefers v6 these days. And it goes out, it connects, it downloads 45k index HTML page, and it works. You don't need to see the content. You can do that yourselves. Uh, trace route's fun. So trace route, uh, the main college website blocks all ICMP. So you'd have just had, a, it would have just been stars here. But you can actually see where it goes from native v6 to through the translator into v4 based on the IP addresses. So it's all transparent. But hops 12 and 21, that's broken on v4 as well. Uh, because um, unfortunately, uh, Queen Mary decided to put RFC 1918 addresses on its WAN facing internet links, which, broke, which breaks path MTU discovery. Um, not very clever, but different, different, different thing. So what does it provide us? Well, it lets us eliminate dual stack. Well, it eliminates dual stack for most of our network and for our customers if they choose not to use v4. Um, it obviously lets v6 users talk to legacy IP. That's the whole purpose of the exercise. Um, we don't have to assign a v4 address to a customer because we've only got a slash 21 of v4, and we've got significantly more customers than that. Um, 
But the complexities of the dual stack are constrained to the translators. Our V6 core doesn't have to do anything with V4, and the V4 doesn't have to do anything with the V6. It makes it a lot easier to turn off the V4 stuff and the translators when we no longer need to do V4. Um, as to when that is, well, that's up to everyone here, really, isn't it? So what doesn't work? Well, Benedict mentions legacy IP literals. Um, that does happen uh, more often than not. Um, but there's, as you know, there's not really much you can do about that. Um, FTP, FTP is just an absolutely horrible protocol that, you know, anyone using it these days shouldn't even, well, you shouldn't use it. Don't use it. Um, makes my life a bit easier. Um, so for those attempting this, there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, because you need a working DNS64 capable resolver. That's the easiest bit. It's about nine lines of config in bind. It's not many lines. I think it's like two lines of config in PowerDNS. Um, and it's easy to test. You know, if you query it for a quad A, do you get a synthesized one back? Um, the first NAT64 instance, what you build doesn't have to be resilient, but it has to work. So build that, bring up ExaBGP. You can even do static routes if this is a dev test network, which obviously it should be. Um, once you know it works, then set the second one up. Are you seeing sessions appear in the second? If you are, duplicate the routing. Test it, shut one down. Did your TCP session survive? If it did, shut down the other one when that one's come up. If that's working, you're pretty much, you're pretty much sorted. So what next? Well, this was sort of a last minute thing, but um, I have 464 XLAT working on one other line and well, some, well, my, my co-director and my one member of staff and some techie customers that love playing with this stuff. Um, it does just work. Um, and you can also, at this stage, get rid of the DNS64, which solves Benedict's problem with DNSSEC validation. Because if you get a... At that point, it becomes completely transparent to the end user that their traffic is traversing the v6 internet or, or the v6 core and we only care if, if, if it breaks our customers you know customers just want it to work they just want to start their stuff get a v, get a v4 or a v6 address and for stuff to just work so um, there is some work required for customers with v6 only on their network that have a mail server and they need to make that available over v4 so we've got some logic in the background that can set up a static translation for picks an IP address, tw port 25 or port 80, and they push it through to a V6 address. And uh, yeah, that just, it works manually. At the minute, that's a manual process, but I need to automate that and bring that into our systems. Um, more from the Queen Mary side, um, we are getting delivery of, of our 100 gig kit, capable kit which will be a switch and two data mover boxes. I've been given permission to abuse them for two weeks and to try and see exactly what kind of NAT64 performance I can squeeze out of uh, modern day server hardware. Um, I hope to present those figures at some point. So those are the RFCs that are relevant. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with them. Um, if not, they're there. Um, PowerDNS, awesome software. If you haven't got, well, if you have, um, if you are reevaluating your DNS system, have a look at their stuff. It's awesome. The developers, pro open source. It does everything I, I, I've ever wanted from a, D, from a piece of DNS software. Just check it out. Hopefully, Bert's watching this. Um, <laughs> don't worry, there's no money changing hands, but he does owe me a beer for that. Um, ITSM and Nick Mexico uh, co-funded the work on Dual, which is the NAT64 implementation discussed here. It's open source. It's, uh, it runs on almost all Linux distros that have kernel 3.10 or later, which is CentOS 7 or latest version of Ubuntu, whatever. Um, XBGP, um, quite possibly one of the few bits of Python that I do use on my network. And uh, yeah. 
I wouldn't be able to do my services without it. Any questions? Thank you, Terry. Are there any? There's one question. Not there. <clears throat> Just one. Um, uh, two, actually. Um, what, what's with uh, uh, legacy IPv4 only clients? Sorry. Uh, wh what happens if you only have if you have a client that only supports IPv4? Okay. So um, currently, our core is IPv6 and our you know, and IPv4, but not dual stack. We've got two sets of routers, as explained. The edge is currently dual stack. We have an edge which is dual stack that has default routes to both v4 cores and v6 cores. Um, and we do provide for business customers v4. Um, we do provide um, some CG NAT, but we want to get away from NAT 4.4 because we're then running two different NAT implementations. It's an absolute requirement that V6 only users can talk to V4 resources. That has to happen. But it's, we'd rather run one NAT implementation on our network than two, if that makes sense. Okay, so it's not like a residential setting when you have a CPE behind it, you have mixed clients, one, some support V6, some doesn't, and then you have to tunnel it in V6 both type of traffic? Yeah, cu currently we have, um, we do have V6 only, we do have V4 only, we have dual stack. This is the V6 only setup. What I would like to get to, to unify all of this, to, to cater for everybody, is to actually get that 464 XLAT in to all of our customer CPEs. All of our customer CPEs are, the way it works is, we have one CPE on the side of the customer's property, which is owned by us, and we manage it. And then we have an Ethernet cable that goes from outside of the house, that piece of equipment, going into the property, and that then plugs into another CPE that can either be theirs or it can be ours, and that provides the wireless connectivity inside the house, and that's, that powers the external one via PoE. So... The customer gets V4 and V6 on that side of the network cable. All the 464X that stuff occurs outside of their router, if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, have you considered MAPT instead of 464 on the CP? Um, it was considered, um, but I was looking at the way the, the, wind, the wind was blowing, so to speak, because I've not had to make the decision to dump the CG NAT that we do have. Um, and I wanted to make sure that, one, it was stable. Um, two, that it was the one of the preferred transition technologies because this, this could be on my network for some considerable time, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years. God, you know, God help us, it's not going to be that long before we can get rid of V4. Um, but I wanted to, to make sure I, I went with something that was, again, going to last. And th th as, as, as Benedict said, you know, there's, there's so many to choose from. You know, there is, there is DS Lite, you know, there is Lightweight, you know, 4 over 6. Which one do you pick? You have to put, put, a, lot, you know, put a line and say, that's what we're going to do. I hope that answers your question. Uh, kind of did, yeah, thank you. And one last question. Of course. Really, really last. Um, uh, <laughs> For, you mentioned dual, so uh, what, what's your experience in terms of uh, throughput? Um? Okay, so throughput-wise, I've tested it to 20 gig full duplex. Um, you do have to obviously make sure your MTUs are configured correctly because uh, taking a 1500 byte V4 packet to V6, adds 20 bytes to the packet, obviously because of the increased size of the V6 header. Um, and obviously if you're doing that, uh, you may need to clamp TCP MSS at some point in the network, if you have to do that. Otherwise things, well, bad things happen. Um, with regards to, um, one recommendation I can make is Joule has the option to store the configuration as JSON. 
um, where you can edit the configuration and it will apply it atomically. I strongly advise that anyone who does deploy it uses that method of configuration because otherwise it just turns into a shell script and you don't want that. It makes it a lot easier to administer with Ansible as well. If anyone wants any Ansible playbooks, I've written some. I'm more than happy to share them. Just contact me on the email address on the, on the first slide. Okay. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much, Terry. No problem.